So thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to read because I'm tired, sorry, uh, but I know what I'm saying, I wrote it. Uh, so I'm delighted to be in conversation tonight with my colleague Linda Villarosa, uh, a professor at our school, about her latest book, Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and on the Health of Our Nation. We should have a book here. If there's a book anywhere in the building, can somebody just... Oh, oh, thank you. Great. I, um, I want you because it's such a, also a beautiful. <laughs> 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 I worked hard on this cover. <laughs> uh, so Linda is the author of and co-author of uh, three books, including this one. She was an editor with Essence Magazine, where she started her career. Am I right? And uh, is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, where she covers race, inequality, and health. Among her many outstanding pieces there, he, um, there was a, she, she has published an essay about medical myths in the magazine's 1619 project that I'm sure everyone read, I did, and a groundbreaking story about the racial disparities of the coronavirus. Her 2018 cover story in the New York Times Magazine, Why America's Black Mothers and Babies Are in a Life or Death Crisis, was a finalist for the National Magazine Award and her 2017 article, America's Hidden HIV Epidemic, won a National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association Award for Excellence in Journalism. She has also won awards from the American Medicals Writers, Medical Writers Association, the Arthur Ashe Institute, Lincoln University, the New York Association of Black Journalists, and the Na National Women's Political Caucus. Villarosa earn, earned a Master of Arts in Journalism from this school in 2013, an <laughs> alumna. Um, uh, best, best school to get a, 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 an MA in journalism in the world. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Colorado and uh, spent a year at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as a journalism fellow. In Under the Skin, published by Doubleday in June, right? Linda, and I'm reading now from the uh, book's jacket, lays bare the forces in the American healthcare system and in, the American, and in American society that cause black people to live sicker and die quicker compared to their white counterparts. Today's medical texts and instruments still carry fallacious slavery era, era assumptions that black bodies are fundamentally different from white bodies. Study after study of medical settings show worse treatment and outcomes for black patients. Black people live in dirtier, more polluted communities due to environmental racism and neglect from all levels of government. And most powerfully, Villarosa describes the new understanding that coping with the daily scourge of racism ages black people prematurely. The Ofra Daily called this book a stunning expose and an eye-opening game changer. The New York Times Book Review said it is a singular and expansive. In this eminently admirable book, there are no easy answers or platitudes. And the Washington Post called it brilliant, illuminating, meticulously researched, sweeping in its historical breadth, damning in its clear-eyed assessment of facts, and yet hopeful in its outlook. Under the Skin is a must read for all who affirm that black lives matter. So congratulations. I know it's uncomfortable to sit there and listen to praise, but you, you know, it's all so well deserved. Um, so my first question, this, the idea is that we'll have a conversation and then we will open to questions. So um, make notes during the conversation if there's something that you want um, Linda to elaborate or, or, or explain more. So, but my first question, um, so that we can start from the beginning, is how this book came to be. You start with this very powerful first chapter that is titled, Everything I Thought Was Wrong. Um, that in, part of what you write is about how you, as a journalist who has covered these issues for such a long time, since the beginning of your career, had assumptions that were um, part of this bias uh, that is so prevalent, and then you learned that all of those ideas were fundamentally wrong. And so what is it that you thought and um, what, why was it wrong? Well, first, so happy to be in conversation with you. So proud of you that you're my dean, our dean. And um, so happy to be in this place where I both teach and was educated. Um, nice to be with my people. Um, well, I started my career at Essence Magazine, which is deeply you know, involved in self-help. We called it self-health. And everything was about individual behavior change. 
So it was about, we have access to 1 million subscribers and say 7 million readers. So the goal was to get everyone to be healthier individually. And by doing that, it would change the health status of the race in general. There's been no time in the history of the country where black um, health status has been equal to white health status or even to other races. And so our goal was if everyone just knows better, they do better. And um, believe me, I did not start my career or writing or even recently figure out that everything I thought was wrong until I wrote the book and then went back, wrote one terrible out, you know, like one terrible draft, and then went back through and said, huh, wait a minute. If I think about this chronologically, I wasn't thinking about what I think now. I was thinking in the past, at essence, doing something completely different. And I thought, and in the sort of feedback that I've gotten from the book, it's been really meaningful that people say, um, it was important for you to be humble and say you were wrong. And people don't usually do that, especially around science. Right. How does your own experience inform this book? Because you are there uh, in the book as a journalist um, in that very you know, vulnerable position of saying I was wrong. But also you uh, relate to a lot of the people that you're writing about as a mother, as a black woman. Um, so how important it is to you? And I get asked that, I'm, I'm irritated when I get that ask, I ask that about my book because it's not about me, but this book, it, it, it is, there is a very clear connection with your personal experience, both as a reporter and, and, and as a black woman in this country. I have an excellent editor right next door at the Times Magazine who, whenever I write any of those New York Times Magazine stories, she says, um, how are you involved in this? And because she can tell my writing gets kind of, I, any of my students know I hate passive voice. And then, but when I'm uh, writing badly, trying to hide the fact that I was somehow involved in whatever I'm writing about, I start to do passive voice. So she's like, were you involved in this? How were you involved in the HIV AIDS crisis in the, in the 90s? And I was like, how do you know? She goes, because I can tell this is so terrible, this <laughs> section. Same with black mothers and babies. She was like, how was your own birth? I was like, that doesn't have anything to do with this. She said, but when you're writing about this part of it, you seem to be weird. You don't sound right. So then I was like, okay, yes, I had a low birth weight baby myself. And certainly in this book, I talk about my father's experience. Who And um, it was about 20 some years ago when my mother called me. I was working at the Times newspaper and she called me and said, come home. You need to come home to Denver, where I'm from. Your dad is very ill and you need to dress up in corporate clothes, put your business cards from the Times in your pocket and I'll meet you at the airport. I'm thinking, what, how, what is happening with my father? Why are we getting so dressed up? So we went, she picked me up at the airport and she said, she was really dressed up and she said, they're treating your father like an N word. And we went to the hospital. It was a veterans hospital where he was. He is a, he's a scientist. He was trained as a bacteriologist. He dresses in perfectly, like perfectly, um, particularly about his clothing, his hair. He was a mess. He was wearing this dirty gown. His legs were, um, I call it shackled to the bed. You know, he was attached to the bed. And he was being treated really badly because he was upset. He was upset that he didn't understand what was going on with him and he was alone and he's black. Once we got there, all dressed up and saying, wait a minute, we're with him. We went home, we got his medals from his military service. We got um, pictures of him before he was ill so they could see what he really looked like. And we explained that he was trained as a scientist and if they were kinder to him, um, then he would respond better. And he ended up dying, but I never, you know, not so long after, but I never forgot that, that, you know, even my father could be treated like that. Then last week, um, I was doing a event at the University of Colorado and everyone was being really nice to me. They're like, are you okay? Some, one person was holding my hand. They're like, are you getting triggered? And I was like, what's wrong with them? I'm fine. And then I realized the University of Colorado Medical School is at the site that this hospital used to be at. I just didn't recognize it until I saw the barracks around it showing that it was a military hospital. And then I was kind of like, oh my God, this is the place where I was with my father. So but before I go into like details and specifics, would you like, I'm assuming some people here might not have read the book yet. 
<laughs> and uh, so can you explain how do you describe this book and your findings? And what is it that is new about the way you are approaching this subject? Well, I think how I say it is just with a series of questions. Why are we in the you know, second wealthiest country in the, on the planet? Why um, do we pay more uh, you know, uh, on healthcare than any other country? We, it's $12,000 per person per year. Why do we have the most advanced technology, yet our health outcomes as a country are among the lowest? If you look at infant mortality, maternal mortality is going up, and we're the highest of any of the wealthy countries. Infant mortality, we're higher than the wealthy countries. All the way to the end of life, we have lower life expectancy than any of the other wealthy countries. But when you look at you know, when you talk about this in the past, at least, and sometimes now people are like, oh, I don't understand what's going on here. And they think of all these sort of technical ways to, if we just spend more money, I was like, well, you, we're spending the most and it's not working. But my, my contention is, is if you look at inequality, if you look at the health of black people and other people of color and poor people separately, race in itself matters here, but also inequality matters. If you look at those two, if, if we were attacking those problems rather than just throwing more money at the system in general, I think there would be a different health status for our country. And I think even in the past for me, I thought of it as more of a black problem. It's like black people are um, ill and it's our fault. And then if we just do better, no better, we'll do better. And now I don't think that. I think this is a problem that is beyond that. It's a problem that's changing the health status of our country and making it look so bad, but we're not paying the right attention to it. Right. You, you start, the, the, the first story uh, in your book is the story of two sisters from Montgomery, Alabama, who were sterilized against their will in 1973. Um, it's, a, it's a devastating story and uh, you tell it with with a lot of uh, compassion but at the same time without saving us from what this means and what they were they went through and then you use you, you use that story but you don't use the story but you you kind of give us that story to talk about the myth that black bodies are different and um, I remember reading the first um, piece I read about this was your uh, piece in the, the 1619th project where you talk about how even today, uh, medical prat practitioners, doctors, um, believe some of that, 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 that black people have different skin and it's thicker or different muscle body and things like that. So tell us why you, you chose the, the story of these sisters and what, are you, what were you showing with this, with this story? Where were you going? I think I'm, I've, it's interesting because my book came out June 14th. And then two weeks later was the end of Roe v. Wade. So now I'm sort of brought back to talk about this. But what I say is the Ralph sisters are part of a through line of um, reproductive injustice that includes um, the lack of you know, abortion services. So the Ralph, Ralph sisters are from Montgomery, Alabama. The state next door is Mississippi. Mississippi is where the Dobbs decision happened. Mississippi is the poorest state. Alabama's like second or something like that. Mississippi has the um, already lost its last reproductive health clinic. Um, it has the highest level of infant mortality in the country. It has the highest maternal mortality. It has the highest child mortality. It's also the state with the most black people. So if you look at what has happened there, so when we lost abortion, it was just one part of reproductive justice. The other part is what happened to the Ralph sisters. So they don't, they lost the ability to have children against their will, they were 12 and 14 when they were sterilized at a public health clinic. It happened because there were a whole bunch of um, unskilled black people coming into Southern cities. When the Ralph sisters, I mean, the Ralph sisters uncovered that 100,000 to 150,000 other women of color mostly and poor women were sterilized around the same time, um, it changed the rule that you know you now can't do that but that story is deeply meaningful to me and i kept being obsessed about it because i'm their age like i was 12 or i was 14 or whatever in the same year so i got obsessed also with finding them and um i did i found them and they were still living in montgomery in public housing um and 
you know, the story got the story got excerpted on in the New York Times magazine. A woman, this is such good news. A woman in uh, Seattle sent me an email to say, "Oh, you know, I'm someone who um, had sort of generational wealth. I'm really wealthy, and I want to do something. And I'd like to give the Ralph sisters twenty five thousand dollars." So I picked up that phone and called her, and then I said, "Can I just ask one thing?" And she said, yeah. And I said, is it 25,000 per person or just the one? <laughs> so it is. it was per person. The sisters got the money. They called me yesterday and said that they bought a house because their thing was to get out of public housing and they bought a house that they now own outright. It's their first time having a house. They don't have a mortgage, they just bought it. And I was so moved by that, but their story really is saying that there's somebody who made the decision because they felt disposable um, and to take away their fertility. Mm -hmm. And they still mourn the fact that they couldn't have children. And it's it just really disturbed me. Right. So women and, and, and the body of, of black women is a big is a big subject in your book. You you start there, and then you know black women's sexuality. They are um, you know um, we, there's a full chapter or two about uh, birth and women giving birth, and um, how um, you are in a disadvantage if you are even if you are a wealthy black woman in this country. Not it's not you know um, so. Um, you write, I wanted to quote from, from, from that one of those chapters, you write, I set out to understand why in our country with the most expensive and advanced medical technology in the world, growing numbers of American women, disproportionately black women, were dying as a result of pregnancy at childbirth, including African American women whose income and education should protect them. And you choose there the story of, of a woman who's um, more privileged than other women in your book. Um, what did you find and, and how that connects with your own story? You mentioned a little bit of, of that at the beginning. I, I really, really tried to kind of get past the myth that um, the problems of America are because of it's all poor women or all poor people and that race in itself is not a problem. It's just the intersection of race and poverty. So I tended to use um, middle class women and birthing people in the stories. But I think the reason I wrote that black mothers and babies story in the first place was because I, someone told me, and I didn't believe it at the time, that a black woman with a master's degree, PhD, MD, JD, is more likely to die or almost die giving birth than a white woman with an eighth grade education. And that's the, that struck a lot of us as journalists, that number, um, as so unfair and surprising and counterintuitive. Um, so I did try my best to um, use women in the book who who signified that, because I think it's easier. It sort of gives people an out if it's like, well, it's a question of poverty. Poverty is terrible. We shouldn't be giving people an out for that. But then if you're saying, wait a minute, that's not right. I, I know my own birth. Um, I had a low birth weight baby um, who was it wasn't a huge crisis, but it was scary. She was she was so small. She fit in the palm of my hand. And I was asking, you know, why would this happen to me? I was I did every single thing right. I was the health editor of Essence at the time, so I was trying to do everything right in public. <laughs> and um, I had a really good doctor. I had really great health care. And so even my doctor was surprised that I had this strange problem. Now the problem doesn't seem so strange because there's so many other women. I was struck at my, you know, I got a really great review in the New York Times book review, but in the middle of the book review, the, the reviewer told about her own near tragic birth. That is unusual for a book review where someone tells their personal story that extensively. But I just thought this crisis is, you know, we've proven it through evidence, we've proven it through science, and now there's just this pile up of personal stories that creates its own kind of evidence. Right. Um, there's a moment that I, f that I found really um, shocking, I and mean, it's not the, the most shocking moment in the book, but uh, at one point you are, you're going to this, um, you're meeting with doctors to talk about your piece that just came out, and you spend time explaining these things and then you realize that no one in the room believes you, that they completely, and they are the ones, that the bias is just so deep that they cannot accept what you're saying. Can you tell us about that moment? 
I remember it was a mid-sized hospital in a you know mid-sized town in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, not Minneapolis. So, and also the thing about their town was they had a huge influx of refugees from Ethiopia and Somalia. So they had a lot of black people, you know, that they were working with at the hospital. So I did the grand rounds of the OBGYN. So I go in, the first thing they say is they start telling me, the head of the OBGYN starts talking about all the work he's doing in, in Africa. So I was like, well, okay, you know, <laughs> thank you for that. That's not my topic, but okay, good for you. <laughs> Annoying. And then the next was, we don't have the problem at our hospital. You know, our births are great. So I was like, mm, okay. Um, <laughs> fine, because I didn't do the, I wish I had looked first. Um, and then it was sort of like, well, we, what we think is, you know, when we have African-American patients, we notice that they don't have much kinship. So we're thinking maybe it's, and I was like, what, how can you make that blanket statement about people? And what is kinship to you? That is crazy. And then they were, uh, and they compared it to their African immigrant patients. Sounds like really getting irritated now. And then they said, well, it's also about nutrition. We noticed, you know, we think it's, we think that when you see these problems, it's a, a lack of nutrition among African-American patients. And I was like, okay, <laughs> there is no research that says that you don't know this. And I'm ill because I'm getting so mad. And, but everything they said, I said, they argued with. And then finally somebody said, well, you know, probably it's a genetic issue. And I was like, well, if it's a genetic issue, why wouldn't you see it in African women as we're all descended from there? Um, and so finally, I had this study that I that looked at four groups of women in Chicago. And it was huge. It's a very good study. I know these guys. They're perinatologists. And I went through the study and I talked about how in one generation, it was um, African women from poor countries and the Caribbean. It was um, black American women, white immigrant women from Europe, and white American women. The first round, when they looked at birth weights, the three groups, all but the African American women, were you know normal birth weight. In the next generation, they looked at their birth weights. And then, in, th in this case, the white American women were the same. The immigrant women from Europe, babies were a little heavier. The black women were still small. But in one generation, the women from Africa and the Caribbean why wouldn't their babies get bigger if they're from poor countries when they come to our rich country? They were smaller and they match the African-American babies. What I said to them, well, if you continue um, believing these myths and thinking these fallacies, look at what will happen to your African immigrant patients. As, and also in that town, you could see the racism happening to the people in the town. But I was so ill and I, you know, one of the things I talk about is the idea of weathering, that when you are dealing with um, negative experiences um, as, as black people, but as anyone who's marginalized or treated badly, it takes years or, you know, takes time off your life. And I just thought, I'm sitting in this room with these ignorant people who are harming others. There were 13 people in the room, 12 white and me, I don't work there. And I just thought, I'm leaving because I just lost an hour or two off my own life <laughs> by being so upset. But, you know, it's just that kind of thing is disheartening. And there's also, you also talk about those myths that are still taught in medical school um, about, you know, like differences that are just imaginary completely and that you know, have a clear history. And so with all of that um, discussion that there, there's been in this country in the you know, in decades and decades about racism and the efforts to, um, you know, change those biases. What do you see in medicine? And you talk about a lot of studies, a lot of um, um, uh, experts who have written and have proven these things with data and how hard it is, how much they are attacked by their uh, colleagues and how hard it is for this bias to change. So at the same time, time you remain optimistic at the end of the book. We'll talk about that, that later. But I wanted to ask you if, if um, ideology, the way I see it, this is an ideology, right? And ideology is really hard to change because you can, that facts don't matter. Um, people can see something that disproves what they believe. There's a lot of you know, data studies on this and they will still not believe it or they will think it's an exception, right? So how, how can this change? How do you change? Um, you know, I'm talking, and I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying something, you know, as 
I would never ask you, how are you changing racism? I'm just saying, how can the medical um, world or industry start to change this behavior and this bias and these wrong beliefs? And who, who's working on that? Well, I think, you know, it shouldn't take um, a pandemic and a murder of George Floyd to change things. But I have noticed things have changed in since, you know, in the, near the end of when I was finishing the book, I was, that's why I could say I was optimistic because I did see some change. I did see change, especially from medical students themselves who were asking harder questions about their textbooks and about their medical education. They were the ones sometimes from the ground up, sometimes from professors at, you know, that were educating them. Also organizations, agencies, the Centers for Disease Control, um, the AMA, many of the mainstream health organizations have um, leaned in toward health justice and health equity, which is exciting. But the, I think the best is the medical students who are trying to make a difference. And I think in the book, I mentioned this medical student at the University of Washington, and she was looking at that thing we were talking about, the kidney function. So the kidney function has a race correction on it. So I had a kidney function test a few months ago, and there's, if you're black, this is your um, score, and if you're white, this is your score. So on my thing, the black was circled, you know, black person score. And it's a calculation that assumes that black people have more muscle mass as a group, and then we, so it means that we have better um, kidney function, ultimately better. So that means that um, even though black people as a group, as a demographic, have um, more uh, end stage renal, renal disease and are uh, left off transplant lifts more often, this myth is getting in the way and maybe causing the disparities. So that um, at that medical school, the University of Washington, this student was taught that and she raised her hand and she said, well, why are there two readings? Why is there a black reading and a white reading? And the professor was sort of like, oh, that's just how it is. And she said, but what's behind it? So he went through this whole muscle mass thing. She said, but black people as a group do not have, how do you know that there's higher muscle mass? It's like, well, this is how it's taught. And it took her a, maybe a year or more going to medical school at the same time as trying to make this change. But now at the University of Washington, they don't teach that anymore. And the National Kidney Foundation has put out a statement recently that was sort of like, well, we're looking into this. But other more activist physicians and students are really fighting to make that change. And that's only one of those kinds of um, myths that are still embedded in current medical practice and um, teaching. You, you teach here, since you're men mentioning teaching, you teach here and you're also teaching at the medical school and city college this semester. I mean, every, every fall, right? Uh, tell us about that. And you mentioned before we started this conversation, uh, you, you told me this, uh, I thought it was very interesting how different it is to teach medical students these issues and how they react. And also, I think I'm really excited by this. I have uh, students who are... Um, first gen or they're immigrants, some of them are new to the country. And so I've had to take them even further back than I normally would in, because I teach, used to teach black studies at City College. And I remember I was talking about stereotypes of black people that get embedded in our, that have been embedded in our culture. And I really went deep and I showed them, these are the stereotypes. And I said, here's how it might how if you think this about a person, if you think a black person is angry or violent or dangerous, then this might be how, what would happen. And, um, and I went through all the stereotypes. And then at the end, this one student raises her hand and she's just so confused. She goes, I really appreciate this because I wonder what happened to that black lady on the pancake box and where she came from. And so I was really, I was like, that's Aunt Jemima. We don't say that anymore. We don't use her, but until recently, she was the face of this pancake. But anyway, um, but I'm really excited that they are learning these and they will be able to, and I said, don't assume it's, it's not your fault. This kind of racism is implicit. You don't, you know, kill yourself. If you have these feelings, recognize and try to fight against them. And then because they're all students of color, the other thing I said to them is you will be a target of this. And this is what I've had, don't usually have to teach when I'm lecturing to medical schools that are predominantly white. I said, people will question whether you are a doctor. People will say something about your accent and assume that you're the receptionist. 
And you have to, or they'll say, please, after you've examined them, they might say to you, can you bring in the real doctor? So you also have to be ready to, you know, sort of stomach this. And how are you going to survive with this kind of thing happening? Because you're going to practice here in our country. So it's a very interesting time, you know, for them. And I guess to have me as their professor, I think they're sort of in shock. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I said to them, I'm assuming this isn't how the rest of your classes go, right? <laughs> uh, tell us also, you talk about the, the link um, between where people live and their health. And I think I think I th I think I have I had ideas. I thought that was kind of obvious, but actually you make it you you show us that it's not obvious what you're looking into. So would you like to talk about that one? I think, you know, I am agree with you. I just thought, well, in poorer communities, of course, there's, you know, fewer services and there's fewer amenities. There's um dirtier air. But then when I, I think I started to look at it in a more nuanced way when I went back to my mother's um, hometown, home community in Chicago, which is Inglewood. So Inglewood people live to age 60 and nine miles north in another community in Chicago, they live to age 90. And my family came up from Mississippi. These are solidly middle-class people who came to this community in Chicago, seeing it as a promised land. And um, it was like many com black communities, um, redlined. So that means people couldn't buy homes. And so then I'm thinking, I'm looking around this community with my mother in 2020, and we're seeing it's destroyed. The um, school she went to with Lorraine Hansberry, the elementary school was gone. It was boarded up. Where I went to elementary school, um, all the places around it, the school was still there, but the businesses were boarded up. The houses had you know, police tape on them. It didn't have, it, places looked more like Mississippi than the middle of Chicago. The, we went to one hospital where my, my father used to work. It was closed. There was, it was hard to find healthy food. There was a lot of drugs in the area. And so I'm thinking, well, okay, it's poor now. But I was like, wait a minute. It wasn't when I was growing up. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that when my mother went there. And then my, par my grandparents owned buildings. And I said, how did grandfather buy a building? And she said, I don't know, it was something about a contract. I later learned that in that neighborhood, black people couldn't buy, couldn't get a mortgage. So you had to, it was already redlined, then you couldn't get a mortgage. So that meant you had to buy with, on a contract. So people never outright owned it. And if you missed a payment, you could miss, you could lose your um, property. So, and everyone I interviewed for this piece that I, I wrote in the Times and shared in the book, they, I interviewed three physicians and all of them said the same thing. The solution to getting better health and more, more life expectancy in this community is not to have more clinics, more doctors, more health. It's to raise the lever, level of wealth, which has been stripped away by these old rules. And they, I think they estimated to something like $3 billion of wealth lost. So wealth, lack of wealth followed the lack of health. And that was surprising to me because I said, this one of the people that I interviewed had started a black men's clinic. He closed it and changed his focus, even though he's a physician, to wealth building. And I thought that's a different perspective than saying to build health, you just need to have more health facilities or people need to be more healthy. But if they can't be more healthy because of institutional and structural racism from the past, then it's a different solution to because it's a different way of framing the problem. Right. And mentioning, talking about solutions, uh, I'm going to read another uh, paragraph from your book. You say, it will be difficult to turn around the health of black communities, burdened as they are by a history of systemic, systemic racism. It will take even longer to append societal racism and stop its, its destructive effects. Putting an end to racism in healthcare while easier to see and solve is also years away, but still I remain optimistic. And um, so you said a little bit about that, but I wanted to, you know, to dig a bit, a, a bit um, deeper in that and to ask how um, journalism connects with that and how awareness connects to that. So it's kind of the opposite question that I asked before. Um, but I assume that you believe because you've dedicated your life to covering these stories and, you've, and writing a book is a pain. So nobody writes a book unless they really believe and like to write about it because why would we go through that, right? Um, but that you think that 
there's a power in that. And this is a journalism school. I deeply believe in that. I wanted to ask you how much can your work and our work and your students' work help, you know, how much that feeds your optimism and should feed all of our optimism. So now from the kind of narr the narrative or the news service uh, perspective, not from the pr practitioner's perspective. Well, I noticed that, I mean, like whenever I'm starting a story or even, you know, the characters in the book, I find someone who is like a doula or a patient navigator or a community health worker. And that person is the connection between the system and the patient. And they're the people who sort of like, they, they understand both sides. So I think that is important in the future of our healthcare system. Um, because they provide a loving and supportive connection between the healthcare system, which is cold and driven by capitalism and often, um, you know, very high tech, but low touch. So I'm very interested in those kinds of people who can help um, sort of fix this problem. Uh, as far as journalism, I think, you know, teaching here, it's really exciting to see so many students very interested in this kind of social justice lens through journalism. And when I first started doing this work, I got pushback that, you know, oh, it's just like, you know, are you just going to do the black stories? Now I don't get that at all. It's like, can I please do something besides the black story? That's what I'm getting now because, but I, that was not the way in the past. The, the past was, well, I don't know anything about this, so it must not be real. And now it's sort of like, well, I understand that I don't know anything about this, but you do. And so can you please, and please illuminate me. And I really appreciate that. I see it also the same with kind of activism, which, you know, I don't think as a journalist, I'd never call myself an activist. If someone says that, I correct them. But I ha do have a point of view. I'm engaged in a certain way. And I see, you know, that um, I see the my students here trying to balance how to balance being, you know, objective and, you know, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> objective. Don't get me started on that. Um, and engaged. And how can you cover the things you want with a certain point of view um, without, while still trying to maintain some kind of objectivity? And it's a real balancing act. It's a real challenge. And it's um, something that we're grappling with now. And I like that we're able to do that here. Right. My last question, and then I'm going to open to to the public, to our community, and is... Um, I found it very interesting that you studied in a um, in a in a magazine that served mostly uh, black readers, and uh, we have a center for community media here. We have initiatives to serve black media, Latino media, and now Asian media. So that is very close to 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 how we see journalism and how we want to broaden this the, the the focus when we talk about the news industry. And so you went from that to the New York Times, which is kind of the most mainstream media, kind of national big organization, kind of the gold standard, you know, in, in theory for 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 journalism here for such a long time. And you talk you mentioned moments where you've had to fight to get your stories published, to get the attention of the editors to um, so there's there's also there you know the and I know a lot of our graduates um, also have to you know uh, learn ways of negotiating and navigating newsrooms and they deal with bias particularly women and people of color. So what would you I don't know how do you you know um, I think we most of our professors here are very aware of that and we do a great job at teaching that I, and we can do a much better job. Uh, but how do you um, you know discuss that with your students here? Well, I'm really grateful for being for growing up in black media because, you know, at at Essence Magazine is where I really learned how to find people for the narratives, how to treat them, how to be engaged in the community, how to as a journalist to, you know, interview people. I learned that through black media. And um it was really important and also a kind of so how to do social justice and approach journalism with a kind of deep empathy. Um, people say, oh my God, you've really gotten trained well at the New York Times. I was like, I got really tra trained well at Essence. Um, and I forgot the rest of the question. So how do you, how do, <laughs> no, how do you train the, your students to, to navigate those oh, spaces? Yes. And, and I, I think what I have done is to just come very well armed. 
just really, this is the evidence that this is a story, a trend, that it matters, and to just beat them down. Um, and I see that the people I interview do that. And that's how they, you know, the scientists, you see scientists who have been talking about racial health disparities and health inequality for 30 years. They are still pumping out the same kinds of studies over and over, just trying to get someone to change somebody's mind. And so I do that too. I um, have so much evidence and so much data and also try to explain things simply. Like I'm not using a lot of medical jargon. I'm explaining it simply, but I have like an avalanche of proof. And that is what has worked well with me. I don't get a lot of pushback anymore, but even at the beginning, I was like, I know what I'm talking about because here's why. And that's what I'm, I just really believe in that when you're trying to convince someone of something, convince an editor of something that it matters. Yes, I agree with that. So questions. Now you have, there, there are mics um, on the sides or you can just shout. <laughs> Grab the mic. There's one there, right there, Jeff. Thank you. I'm so happy you're our colleague, Linda. Um, I want to follow up on Graciela's last question. Uh, you are rewriting the way that medicine is covered now. I think you've done nothing less than, than the book, and obviously through the lens of equity and race. Uh, you're a wonderful, proven journalism teacher, and, and glad to have you here. I wonder whether there's, there's anything you've learned about how we should be changing the teaching of journalism in everything we do through that lens. Um, different goals, different techniques. What, what should we be doing as a school? Well, you know, I see some of my students here, <laughs> so you know what I'm going to say is um, I think when I, sometimes the students come in and they're really just so excited to make a difference and to sort of be engaged. And I think we're, what we have to do and what we are doing is to say, you have to do it through the rules of journalism. <laughs> So yes, we want, I'm like, I'm so happy those Ralph sisters got a house, but that wasn't my goal. I was writing a piece about, you know, linking the history of um, eugenics and them to something today, to current day eug eugenic schemes. And that was the goal. I'm happy that it had a good outcome, but that wasn't what I was going for. So I think we just have to stick by and with a little bit more understanding that the current crop is very interested in a social justice lens and to make change. So I, you know, I'm not saying here necessarily or who, but I have seen some pushback against what they want to do. And I think that is not helpful, but it's holding the hand and saying, no, I get what you're trying to do, but let's just do it this way. Let's make sure. And don't say, you can't do this thing. You have to go, you know, do be a mainstream journalist because that's what I learned 30 years ago when I was started out at the Daily News or whatever. It's like, wait a minute, let's figure out how we can do this in a way that still honors their real hunger to um, mix kind of be engaged journalists because a lot that is what is interesting in modern journal. That's the newest thing is having that. And so we just have to figure out how to teach it with a little bit more compassion, I think. So thank you so much for the excellent, important book. And thanks for sharing uh, with, this, with us this evening. I was curious in, in the chapter about Appalachia, um, how did that, can you tell us a little bit about the decision-making in terms of when you decided to report and, and how you, um, decided to incorporate that into the book? Um, well, it was funny because at the when I first got um, my book contract, I didn't have that chapter in there in that way. And um, so two things happened. I asked the editor, I said, you know, this is like, this is really a black book, okay? Is that okay? We call it the health of a nation. And she said, well, why don't you do like, you know, the other books that you read? Like you're reading a book and it's like, white, white, this and that. And then there's all of a sudden the black chapter. So why don't you just all of a sudden put the white chapter in? So I was like, okay. <laughs> and then also I wanted to show, I, I was talking about weathering. So the idea that the lived experience of being treated badly in America 
prematurely ages the body. And it's not unique to black people. It's just that we've been treated badly for longer and it's gone on you know, longer, still happens and it happens more often. And so anyway, so it's, but it's, so most of the time when you're talking about weathering or premature aging as a concept, it's about black people and other people of color. So I started thinking, well, I, Dr. Arlene Geronimus, that's her concept. So I talked to her about it and she says, it's not a black thing. It's just that if you look at po white people who have been treated badly, a group of them, and I thought, where is a group of white people who have been treated badly? West Virginia. West Virginia is like, I think it's probably the second whitest state or the whitest state. It's the state where people, you know, it was when I went and reported, and maybe it's still happening, there was an AIDS outbreak. Why is there an AIDS outbreak in this day and age someplace? Because of opioids. So they pump, you know, this, this poor state uh, scaffolded by a coal industry, which is terrible, terrible to work as a coal miner. Then the jobs start to recede. People are in pain. The pharmaceutical companies pump in opioids. Then they get in trouble, so they pull them out. So now people are addicted to their shooting drugs. They're addicted to heroin. So I thought, hmm, that's a good place where people are in crisis, in pain. I want to go see what it looks like. I've driven through. I'd never been there. So in the middle of COVID, which was probably not the best idea. Um, I drove, I drove down there. I went to a syringe exchange and I went to a drop-in center for people who were um, homeless or houseless. And what I saw was people who had that premature aging, you know, they looked old. I kept getting their ages wrong. Like I thought somebody who was 50 was 70 because they just looked terrible. And then if, and I listened to their stories and I thought, this is an important chapter for me to say, this is important for me to say, because this isn't about something genetic or something different about black people. This is about people just being treated badly and being marginalized. And it was a really great experience because I found people so wanting to talk because they haven't been listened to at all. And, you know, it was just, you know, Nobody talked anything about politics in West Virginia. I certainly didn't go there, but I did talk about how people were living and how people were treated and how people were feeling and their health. And so many people had so many or were dying or sick from diseases that happened much later in life. And that struck me. Hi, Linda. It's such a powerful book. Um, I feel so honored to be your colleague and um, I love the Appalachia chapter. That was a brilliant idea to do that. Um, so, well, I'm definitely gonna be um, assigning the book to my students in their health journalism class in the spring. And I know that it'll be very inspiring to them. We do have a lot of students who want to cover health disparities. So my question is kind of um, thinking about how that form of journalism is evolving to get your thoughts about that. Because you write in the book about how for you, you know, starting out years ago, like you had this more like self-help, you talked about the self-help concept and then you know over time studies came out you had conversations with public health people and you realized no this is not about individual behavior this is a systemic issue with discrimination and racism so students today they don't have to go through that because you've done it for them right so they can start with the book and and other work that you know that health journalists are doing and start covering disparities not to say oh these things exist this is re real but they can kind of you know start there and, and go forward from there and so i guess i'm just curious kind of what your thoughts might be about sort of where would you like to see, you know, today's crop of very eager social justice oriented health journalists like focusing their efforts if they want to cover disparities and, um, you know, where should they be, you know, kind of putting their energies that will be maybe the most effective and most compelling? Um, that's a great question. And I think that um, it should be local. So, um, if you look at what's happening locally, so, you know, at the New York Times, I'm not doing that. I'm going, you know, I might be looking at a local place, but it's always with the goal of nationalizing it or globalizing it. And, and I'm really interested in um, the student stories that look at, you know, what's happening on the ground in communities. And I think that's a great place to start. It's building on what we learn here. You know, you start and craft in a community. So what's interesting or 
happening or worrisome in the community that you're covering. I think that's, I, I'm seeing that. Um, I'm seeing some of the students that we share um, doing that and going into the community and looking deeply at what's happening on the ground. And I think that's super important and really um, valuable and uh, rewarding. I think I'm okay, Jeff. The uh, uh, reporting project like this and organizing, uh, which we often over, overlook, was there anything uh, that you didn't get, you couldn't get in, you couldn't quite, whether you couldn't get it or it didn't fit? Uh, yes, there are uh, two things. The first is epigenetics. So whenever I go out to speak, 100% somebody asks, Oh, you know, can we talk about epigenetics and can we talk about the trauma that's passed down? But it was too hard to get into that. And I was taking already too long with finishing the book. I had too many things, but I really am interested in that. And I get asked it so often that I feel like, oh, I need to figure that out. And, you know, as a, another article or something like that. The other thing is that my book happened so close to the end of Roe v. Wade that I wish I had had a more... Uh, better and longer, I think I would have a whole chapter on reproductive justice, the Black-led reproductive justice movement that goes beyond just abortion care and go and talks about, um, you know, sort of the, the right for a, a birthing person to have a baby, the right not to have a baby, and the right, if you choose to have a child, that you have, um, your baby is healthy and in a safe environment, which is beyond sort of the, when the end of Roe, everyone was sort of focused on, oh my God, what's the next law? And I was thinking if we had just thought about reproductive justice in this broader sort of black woman way, it would be a different way to look at it. It wouldn't be so polarizing. And I could have, I had a lot of good stories about that, but I just thought, I felt like I was going, I stuck more to maternal mortality and infant mortality and wish I had had a broader argument because now I'm asked about it a lot. And I don't have, I'm like, well, don't look at this book to find that. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so yeah, those are my two regrets. Maybe one last question, because I, I hear there's drinks waiting for us outside. I don't want to be in the way. Um, hi, my name is Diara. I also was a student here, graduated in 2019, and my background is more in environmental science. More recently, my focus has been in de disinformation research with uh, Engel in Health Misinfo as well. So my question really boils down to, as students who are reporting in health or reporting in general, and they are finding evidence, as, as you pointed out in your beautiful book, that there is truth to some of these issues that people who go to the doctor, who may be apprehensive about trusting said doctor, because of the, the evidence as presented here, what is the best approach for, say, that student reporter or journalist in general, as they have all this evidence and they're approaching mis and disinformation in health and they're trying to answer that question? Like, wh what advice would you have to share with them? Um, I think you just have to stay the course. I mean, there is a story in of itself to talk about why people of color, especially black people, are distrustful of the system. And it certainly came out in the in, you know, big around uh COVID testing and then the COVID vaccine especially. And then but then if you looked closely, it was sort of like, well, we're talking about also access. There was less access, especially at the beginning to COVID vaccines. At the same time, there was blame around, well, it's just because they don't want the vaccine, but there's truth because there is a distrust. And how I think, you know, I am super scared of making a mistake. And so I'm very cautious around the reporting, around getting pulled into some dis disinformation, um, you know, pool or something like that. So I'm caution is how I do. Not everyone has the luxury of taking so long. Like I, my book was, I was supposed to write it in a year and a half. It took more like three years, I, but I was in trouble. I had the terrible Zoom meeting where it was the agent and the editor saying, if you do not finish this book in six months, give back the advance. <laughs> Like, okay, I'm finishing. So I do take no, a- say, sue me. No, I don't. I said, I will finish. <laughs> I was scared. But, um, but I also think, you know, 
it takes me a long time to do things because I want to get everything right. And not everyone has that luxury, but I really check everything super thoroughly because, and especially now, because you can get pulled into something. I get sometimes weird stuff happening to me because of the 1619 project. So, you know, all the kind of drama around that, I get some, you know, people trying to lure me into things and stuff like that. I'm sure, you know, others do too, but I notice that. So I am cautious. I think also, um, you know, I have great empathy for people who are distrustful of the system, um, black people. And a lot of people, you know, we're having the conversation about, and they're like, well, because of Tuskegee or whatever. I was like, no, because of what happened to your family yesterday. What happened to the woman who reviewed my book? What happened to people we know? Um, so there is real reason to distrust the system, but because I'm more positive about it, I'm just hoping that the, that generation of medical students that I'm trying to train are the ones that change the system and make a difference. Thank you so much. Uh, you can continue asking your questions and comments outside. We invite you to go there. I have three final words, which are by the book, uh, or by her book, by this book, uh, and um, we'll see you outside. Thank you.